Now I know that there is this. I can tell. But if you want, over no. here. You find here. here. So <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dennis, for this uh, invitation, nice presentation. Thank you to the conveners for organizing this uh, this seminar. I'm very happy to be here to present some thought about being indigenous uh, in Chile, in particular from the point of view of uh, the Mapuche uh, in southern Chile, and a few thoughts about indigeneity, belongings, and other processes. To begin with, just a few elements. Um, I adopt here a state-based perspective, uh, which is, of course, of course, just one vantage point, it's not the only one, but this is uh, what I would like to present today. Uh, it is also an important vantage point because uh, the Mapuche themselves have presented many <coughs> claims uh, to the state. So there is this relation between uh, the state and uh, the Mapuche, which is quite important. And in particular, they have presented claims for uh, having legal recognition, with, which has been granted uh, with the law uh, passed in uh, 1993, and also in regard with the historical debt uh, that the Chilean state has uh, towards, them, uh, towards them. So uh, the other point I want to make sure when I speak about um, identity or indigeneity, um, I don't believe, I don't consider that these identities are something fixed with uh, cultural borders uh, very term. It's a processual, uh, processual dynamic uh, relation, and uh, which is always, uh, of course, changing and newly shaped. But the fact is that this is not uh, the way the, the state considers this, because the state, through the legal recognition, has set some criteria, quite fixed criteria, to uh, determine who is Mapuche and who is not Mapuche, or who is indigenous and who is not indigenous. <coughs> and uh, this legal recognition has then put a strain on um, exclusive definitions of belongings. So it has become something quite fixed. And uh, this explains also that authenticity, uh, which is seen as authentic, authentic Mapuche, has become a main concern for uh, many social actors, so maybe be Mapuche or uh, for the, the state representatives. So, it works. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, the, just to begin with, um, you might have been heard of uh, uh, Plan Impulso Araucaria that has been launched quite newly by President Piñera for the promise of his uh, campaign. And um, it has been attacked and criticized from many sides. I don't want to come on uh, all these uh, critics now, uh, just to mention a few uh, main critics. Uh, there, is, there were critics. Uh, regarding the lack, the absolute lack of consultation of indigenous people uh, in the elaboration of the plan. Uh, the uh, very partial view it gives on the so-called Mapuche conflict in the South with the idea of terrorism, and uh, also on, on violence, and the accent set on a narrow understanding of what is uh, desarrollo, development. So very uh, neoliberal, uh, made around mercantilization and consumerism. Mm -hmm. So just a few uh, ideas. But uh, I want to understand just one point. This is this idea of the necessity to pacify the, uh, the Araucanía, the, the pacification of the Araucanía, which reminds us, of course, it doesn't work. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, of the premises of the Chilean occupation in the southern uh, uh, region of Chile, the, the region <coughs> southern of the Bio Bio River, uh, which was uh, during the second half of the 19th century uh, occupied by a military enterprise, uh, a colonial enterprise, that is known under the name La Pacificación de la Araucanía. So there is very many similar uh, similarities between these uh, names and the names uh, the name of the plan, the newly uh, set plan, and this pacification has led to the dispossession, reduction, pauperization, and death 
of many Mapuche, uh, as well as several attempts of forced assimilation into the Chilean states, and also on the other side of the border in Argentina, for a similar uh, history at the same time. So this semantic proximity between the terminology uh, is meaningful because the pacification is a well-known story in Chile, uh, quite important in the narrative of the nation-state, how the nation-state has been constructed, and insofar I cannot help but uh, detect more than transformations, but similarities, uh, long-lasting patterns of representation of the place of indigenous peoples, and in particular Mapuche in, in Chile. Um, the point is, this plan is not uh, uh, considering or affecting all the indigenous people in Chile, not even all the Mapuche. It is. It reproduces the I. It reproduces the idea that Mapuche are uh, just in the ninth region or the, the, the region of the Araucanía, uh, as the, as if the, the ethnic <coughs> identity or borders would be uh, in real coherence with the geographical administrative borders of the regions. So the plan Araucanía is for uh, the this region and this does not consider other regions where there are Mapuche like the region Metropolitana, uh, Region de los Lagos, or the region of the, uh, the Bio Bio, which is the one where I was uh, working. So I have begun working there in 2001 and uh, <coughs> I'm still going there after my PhD uh, fieldwork there. Uh, working on the topics that were mentioned by, by uh, Denise, and since then I try to go regularly there, and I will also begin a new uh, project. I will uh, finish with this new project at uh, the end of my of my talk. So uh, maybe to begin with, we have a saying in French, which is about <coughs> the Cam relation. The idea is uh, what is uh, first, the egg or the hen. If you have an egg, you have to have a, a, a hen before, but the, the egg to have a hen. And on the other side, if you have, if you have a hen, you have uh, to have an egg to, to have a hen. So this describes a circle where it is impossible to understand uh, its, its beginning. And this is a little bit what I would like to present today, because this uh, also can be um, the, the relation be between people and land, as it is set by the indigenous law, can be understood by this impossibility to understand where indigeneity or Mapuche begins. That's what I will try to, to show. Uh, my talk is going, sorry, I just have to find my notes, yes. Uh, to have three parts. I will speak about this uh, people and land relationship uh, in regard with the law first, how is it? And then I will describe the patterns of occupation in this region where I was working to question a little bit this idea of fixed borders or special borders and uh, indigenous identity to questions and the third uh, practices of mobility and immobility imposed by the by the states. So uh, the law, you probably know a little bit of the indigenous law in Chile. Uh, it was passed 1993 uh, by President Erwin and uh, in consultation with uh, some Mapuche and indigenous people uh, associations. And it has several uh, implications. So the first legal uh, recognition of the presence, the actual, the current presence of indigenous people in Chile. They were first con uh, before considered, officially considered as being part of the history of the nation, but not of the presence, present. Um, this uh, this law sets criteria to define who are the indigenous and who are the Mapuche in, in Chile. And it also um, has uh, created the CONADI, which is the Corporación Nacional de Desarrollo Indígena, which 
uh, has many uh, purposes and, and tasks, but also one quite important mission is uh, the one of certifying, certifying people and certifying land. So who are indigenous people and who are, uh, which are the borders and the reason to have indigenous lands. So, and this is uh, the Conadi uh, Oficina in, uh, in Caliete, which is the house <coughs> near uh, Elipura, where, where I was uh, doing field work. And if we go uh, to To, to what the law says. Um, on the first, quite at the beginning, it defines the Mapuche as people having uh, indigenous land together, or individual or together. So ha possessing indigenous land. And then later, it defines indigenous land as possessed by uh, indigenous people. So it's not easy or impossible when one considers the law to understand if first it was the land that was indigenous and then like passing this quality uh, to, to the people dwelling of it, or if the people are the indigenous and then uh, for this reason because the people are indigenous, <coughs> there is uh, an indigenous character of the land they occupy. And this is important in regard to recognition because there are a lot of issues and claims around uh, this uh, property and also about uh, around the authenticity of the Mapuche, which is, uh, has become quite a, a, a great issues between Mapuche themselves and between Mapuche and uh, the states, this idea of authenticity. So, <coughs> if you have been to Mukunio, this, uh, this statue, um, when one refers to the Mapuche, there are two ideas generally. The one is that uh, the Mapuche are very brave and independent, and as such, they have been quite mobilized uh, as heroic figures that uh, were quite important for the nation at its beginning. So they were like the last ones uh, independent from the Spaniards and insofar the first uh, uh, like the, the builders of the Chilean state have relied on their proximity with the Mapuche to uh, legitimate their, their claim of autonomy uh, in regard with the, the, the Spanish crown. And this is a reminder of this in Temuco, in the, in the main city of the region uh, Araucania. Uh, we can see the statue and there are uh, like five. Uh, there is another character uh, back. And this homenaje a la región de la Araucania. There's a matching from the Mapuche Chaman. From uh, Soldado de la Pacificación, Colono, Alfonso de Arcia, which is the main figure uh, of the state uh, building, and California. So there, there is a, this idea of mixedness between the first settlers and uh, the Mapuche. So um, as if the Mapuche would be really uh, the first of the, of the, the first real, truly Chileans and the, the very brave and independent one. But on the other side, as you know, uh, there is also the idea of the conflict, the actual conflict and, and this idea of terrorism. So all this uh, idea of the belligerent Mapuche is newly reintegrated into inauthentic claims uh, made by uh, Mapuche generally regarding land, uh, land tenure, not, not only, but this is a, a main issue, the idea of land uh, tenure in South Chile. So these two ideas are uh, always very near one from the other when one addresses the topic of the Mapuche in, in the south. But they are also very related <coughs> to the region of the Araucania, making the other region or the Mapuche living in other region like uh, less legitimate and a kind of uh, living in the in a gray zone, not being real Mapuche and uh, not being either uh, real uh, uh, Chilen Chilenos, Chilenas, or the 
there is this uh, tension. And this is important in regard with the, the criteria set by the law because it's very uh, exclusive. This is this, uh, this idea of exclusive belongings, exclusivity of the exclusiveness of uh, the land, the character of the land, either indigenous or not indigenous, and can either be indigenous or not indigenous. And this is not at all uh, um, um, current, uh, um, accurate picture of the identity dynamics in, uh, in the south, in southern of Chile and probably also in Santiago, but I don't know very well the situation in, in Santiago. And if we go uh, back to Alicura, we have uh, the idea that the real Mapuche or the, 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 the indigenous land, Mapuche land, the real Mapuche land, where uh, was set by the so-called Titulo de Merced. And these Titulos de Merced were uh, like a cadastro uh, made by the state after the pacification after the reduction of the Mapuche in, in small reserves. And uh, it is often, not only, but often uh, linked to the, the land claims because many Mapuche communities want to get back at least the land they had uh, when they had the Titulo de Merced. And this is one, um, two, two ways of mapping indigeneity in, in Elicura. Uh, this is one of the comunidad, la comunidad um, Melimania, which is here now. And these are the eight <laughs> comunidades actually in, uh, recognized in Elicura. And th these are comunidades because this is uh, uh, the form of the association, like it's a very occidental and state based form of putting uh, people uh, together. <coughs> So this is two ways of mapping land occupation in Elicura, of framing how land and people can uh, be superposed one to, with the other. But it's very reductive, as I say, because first, not all this uh, land, which is defined here, is occupied or owned now by Mapuche communities or Mapuche families. And also, there are many Mapuche who do not live in this eight uh, comunidades, but in the which is white, which are uh, all uh, land pieces held by uh, Wicca. So this is where the Mapuche live, and uh, the white is uh, owned by Wicca, <coughs> by two Wiccas. Uh, Wiccas, uh, these are uh, the, Chile, the name for the Chileans who are not Mapuche, and uh, they are like it's like a village. It's called it's not really a village here where. Uh, Mapuche and uh, Winka live uh, side by side. So it's difficult to consider that the only in indigenous land is the land uh, that comes from the Titulo de Merced, and it's also difficult to uh, think that uh, the Mapuche are the ones living on these pieces of land. But still, the way uh, the law defines uh, things. So. Um, there are contestations of this, of course, uh, and one of them has taken place in 2014, and I, I take this picture at this time. Um, there was the, the, that was the first land seizure in Elicura uh, by one uh, community that wanted to get back. This, uh, this is, sorry, uh, the community now is here and they want to get back all this uh, piece of, of land. And they have succeeded. The Conadi uh, helped them to buy or, or buy the, the the land, back, which is one of the purposes or mission of the Conadi. Uh, but it's like often it's uh, a little bit in between right now. So the land theoretically has been bought, but it's still farmed by the uh, by the Winka, uh, farmers. So there's still. Uh, a little bit something open. That was not the first time that this piece of land was returned to Mapuche and it has never been effective until now. So even if the law says uh, it belongs now to the Mapuche families, there is still an in-between situation uh, which is not very, very clear. 
and there are now, since this year, in two months, these other claims uh, for uh, land uh, from other communities in, in Eligura to, to reclaim the, the land they should have. But what is interesting with this idea of land and people together is that it's, it is impossible to think that real Mapuche or that Mapuche have practices of mobility. That Mapuche would not be living where they do have land or they should be living even where they do have land. And this is absolutely not uh, how people live, actually. Uh, not in Elikura, I think. Uh, probably no word. Uh, for instance, there are many uh, people li living in, in uh, many areas of Santiago, like the people who live there and then they come back after a while, after a few years, uh, or they go back and forth between Santiago and Elipura. There are many young people also that just go uh, for the picking fruit season, the fruit picking season uh, to Rancagua, for instance. So they go there for one month, two months, uh, or three months is to work, and then they, they come back. So it's like short-term mobility, or shorter than the people, the people dwelling in, in Santiago. There are many people crossing the borders towards um, Argentina, so like working and living between Chile and Argentina. And uh, also people who live their whole life uh, in Santiago, who come back uh, to, uh, to Alipura, and this is one of the RUCA they have uh, uh, constructed and they practice uh, like Mapuche tourists now in Alipura. So there are many ways to be mobile and also children who are raised in the rural uh, side uh, by their grandparents and their parents are still living and working in Temuco, Concepcion or Santiago and then, or, or young people that, uh, who go away, who go away, who go to Santiago to study, or, or Temuco, or Concepcion. So uh, there are many mobilities, many forms of mobilities uh, in the South. <coughs> Some of them are really uh, probably the consequence of the pulverization, the reduction, so that the chronic land, land shortage that has been initiated by the state politics but others that are probably quite uh, different for, for different reasons. So, um, personal reasons uh, or uh, other structural uh, reasons or choices also. It's not always uh, an obligation to, to go or to come back. <coughs> so there are ma many mobilities, many forms of uh, mobilities between these uh, places. So seasonal migration, life course migration and so on. And newly in the south, um, I have been there like one and a half year ago, and I was surprised to consider to, to see the first time that uh, we have uh, like visibly migrants, new migrants coming in, uh, in the south. For instance, in Cañete, where there was this uh, picture of the Kanadi uh, office, uh, there are two Chinese shops that opened like two years ago now quite new, uh, held by Chinese people, speaking Chinese, the hard uh, Chilean people. And they, they, you, you go, you speak, if you go to the, to the shops, you speak with the Chilean people, but you pay always to the Chinese uh, person who managed the, the, the economic part visibly. Okay? And also there are a few street sellers that I had never seen before. Probably, as far as I can say, Quechua, coming, uh, Quechua family is coming from Bolivia, who come for a few months to sell things and then go back. And this new, mm, or newly to be seen migration in the south is a situation that is quite uh, different from the other uh, regions of Chile. In the north, it's, it's quite usual to, to have migrants, for instance, and of course in Santiago. It's, it's very usual also. But in the south, it was the first time that it was as, at least that visible. And interestingly, the Quechua families were selling uh, Mapuche jewelry. So uh, <laughs> they, 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 they were uh, but not handicrafted, but just <coughs> manufactured uh, jewelry. Quite cheap if you compare to uh, the handicrafted of the 
Mapuche Women or Mapuche Associations. And um, they were there with, with, their, uh, with their family. And I really wonder how the interaction of these new mobility, new mobile, new migrants might um, reconfigure social relationships in southern Chile in many ways. Because some of these migrants are, of course, indigenous or even indigenous or belonging to indigenous groups recognized as such by the indigenous law in Chile. So are they going, are they considered as a threat or as allies, maybe, in broader indigenous uh, claims or considerations? Uh, is there any chance that all these anti-migration discourses and narratives, which are very uh, broadly uh, represented in Chile, they were, I mean, the discourses about the dangers and threat of immigration were to be heard in the south before there was migrants, or basically uh, new migrants. So is this new situation uh, affecting the relationships between the weak, uh, so this white, uh, the, 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 the descent of the white settlers, and the Mapuche, and maybe the claims, and also this idea of what is indigenous land, and uh, what, who are the people who uh, should live there. So, um, ah, yes, I follow this, sorry. This is also an example of migration. These are, uh, I don't know if you know this, the, the site, Polin. This is a um, website. Uh, by a Mapuche family living in Rotterdam. And they are second generation uh, uh, migrants in, in Europe because their parents uh, were escaping the dictature. So they're also reconfiguring, reconfiguring uh, Mapuche belonging abroad. So there's also this history of uh, political, uh, political exiles. So as uh, First conclusion, the state-based definition of the indigenous quality really outlaw uh, actual practices of mobility, just really reduce belongings to a very um, close relationship with uh, the land and, and rural land. So it legitimates like forced immobility on traditional territory. I mean, people are not forced to stay there. Sometimes they are even forced to go away if they want to survive. But the authenticity of their belongings, of their uh, uh, Mapuche identity, is then put into question because it doesn't correspond to the criteria of the indigenous law. So these modes of mobility is on circulation between uh, the, the land and the people and the people <coughs> in the land is a colonial legacy and state-based representation of, exclusive, of the exclusiveness of borders and belongings. But also, as I have said, I would like to go beyond this new project of mine, which is uh, named Immobile Others in Chile, redefining race and the nation state from indigenous and migrants' perspectives, uh, which is, has just been uh, uh, launched now. So I hope to uh, have more to say about this later. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, for the fantastic talk. So, um, any question for her? No? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Very fascinating presentation. I wonder uh, to understand this uh, association between the Mapuche people and the, and the land are part of, um, let's say, I, I was thinking about Hale's distinction between the indie permitido, like the allowed uh, indigenous person, and the conflictive or mm -hmm. negative uh, representation of indigenous people. As, uh, for example, uh, the example you mentioned about these rukas that are sometimes built not in the countryside where they're supposed to be, but in the city, and how they are, I don't know if they are more like. Uh, positive or negative representations uh, of indigenous communities? Uh, from representations from, from the, the state or the, the state, state or, or, or okay. Um, sometimes it's not that easy to, 
to see if it's positive or negative uh, representation. I think this border between Indian <coughs> and Indo and Malo and Indian and, and Indo Malo uh, is uh, sometimes shifting. In fact, uh, in particular, if you listen uh, here, um, this is the family of a communist, a Mapuche communist activist, quite well known in the, in the region. Uh, so uh, there is this idea that uh, the cultural part uh, of the Mapuche identity is permitida because it's, it's good to have uh, like uh, uh, diversity. There's this idea of, of uh, protecting the diversity of the cultural heritage uh, in the nation. But on the other side, there is also this fear that this cultural identity might uh, be used or become uh, like the, 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 the basis for political claims for independence or uh, territorial claims. So uh, the border between El Indio Permitido and El Indio Malo uh, is sometimes very difficult to, to, to see uh, on a daily basis, not in the absolute, but on a daily basis because it might be the same relation within, uh, between one uh, public servant and one family, for instance, one person. Sometimes this person is considered as having legitimate claims or legitimate identity. And maybe in another uh, situation, this very uh, same person is seen as having uh, claims that might threaten the, the state. So there are these two ideas, what is convenient and what is not. Uh, but sometimes in, in, in the experience of the people, the, the, the border is blurred between uh, these two. And there is also this very important, it was always very important when, when I was there, from all sides, uh, the competition between three kinds of being Mapuche. There were the political ones, uh, the cultural ones, and the religious ones. So there's also always a competition with which are the authentic and the good ones. So the cultural ones usually are the good ones. They just want education uh, intercultural uh, bilingue, for instance, like teaching at Mapudo Women's School. Um, the religious ones are like so-so. Uh, they are uh, almost all the Mapuche in Alicura are uh, evangelical, or theodist. So on the one side, they are seen as not being political, so not threatening the, the, the state and uh, the, the national territory. But on the other side, they are also seen as having used a lot of their uh, identity, cultural identity. And of course, the political ones are the ones that are more often seen as problematic as a, an Indio Malo, because they, they really have claims uh, against the state uh, for recognition or for uh, even sometimes for auto-determination. But this, uh, one person can be at one time of his life, of her life, um, a cultural Mapuche or defined as cultural Mapuche, then becoming religious and then becoming politic and back and forth. So there are many uh, examples of people shifting places between these three ways of being Mapuche. I, not, I do not consider that there's three different ways, but if there, uh, there is a competition between uh, these groups of who are the real Mapuche, and because this, this idea of authenticity, which is so important for state-based criteria and recognition. Mm -hmm. And I'm thank you, Ariel, for the um, I just have, um, I wonder if you could speak a little more about um, uh, the ways the Mapuche people perceive territory, because uh, I assume the state recognizes collective territories, and I wonder, or not, I don't know. Not, not. And I wonder how uh, do people themselves uh, claim territory, a collective or in an individual way? Or, yeah, yeah. This was what I said. It's a very state-based presentation. Uh, the Mapuche, Mapuche I was working with, um, they do not, as far as I have understood, consider these borders are being uh, really exclusive or, or, or fixed borders between uh, land, Mapuche land, and other land. They have uh, more comprehensive uh, understandings of the whole place, and of course, uh, these slots are individual. 
uh, property. There are no more uh, collective property in, in Elikura. There are not so many left, but in some times there are, but not in Elikura. But there are places with historical and cultural significance for all the communities in Elikura. For instance, there is one cemetery. Uh, the, there are like uh, Nyanyan and Nyogel Nyogel. Uh, there are a few places and the Kai Kai, there's three um, like um, Mawidas. Uh, with uh, important signification for the whole <coughs> communities in regard with uh, the way uh, the Mapuche consider themselves integrated. It's, it's stupid to say integrated with it because they are part of something. They're not integrated. They're really part of uh, this whole valley, uh, which is owned mainly by uh, Winka uh, in the middle. But all around the, the small mountains, there are um, the property of uh, industriales. Uh, so that there are just folk uh, with uh, mines and eucalyptus. And they are not allowed to go there. I mean, there are uh, people guarding this uh, eucalyptus with, uh, with arms. But I wanted to, uh, as good Swiss, I just wanted to do the holiday, to walk in the mountains. And it, was uh, it was possible because I was allowed to go. But for Mapuche people, it's not possible to, to go there. It's um, so uh, they, they see the whole Mapu, they, this specific place, as something that is not at all uh, crisscross with borders uh, and different belongings, but this is not represented or not considered uh, neither by the state or uh, by the legal uh, land tenure mm -hmm. and land possession. Mm -hmm. Another question, comment? Yeah, I uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, I was just wondering about, uh, if, had you experienced any sort of, um, um, or can you give us an example how they could perform this uh, authenticity? Um, because I, I, I'm wondering if recognition in Chile, like self-identification, is based on these certificates of indigenous belonging, mm -hmm. which allows mobility. Mm -hmm. But how this mapping this mapping process uh, could um, produce or I don't know, like trigger these uh, <coughs> performances of uh, authenticity in this more um, poinetis, uh, the kind of recognition way. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how the state could, uh, producing these boundaries, these maps, could uh, fix identities and the performance of authenticity. I don't know if I'm Yes, I, I think there are like two questions, if I understand. Could be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have examples mm -hmm. of uh, performance of, of authenticity. It was funny for me when I went first uh, to this place in uh, 2001. Um, people were telling there are no, no Mapuche here because uh, it's the region of Bio Bio, the Mapuche are in, in the other region. Mm -hmm. But then I was living in a place uh, where uh, People were saying they were Mapuche and they have Mapuche apellido surnames and so, and uh, the the like the friend of mine or the, the this, uh, leader of the Mapuche of one community in Elikura uh, invited me and he was just uh, constructing a, a folklore group Mapuche group mm. and I was there in the first. Uh, the first time they met and they were preparing an exhibition uh, in uh, Concepcion and they were like uh, getting together all the clothes they had found I don't know where from the grandmothers and so and I, I was working with uh, well, I was with one at this time and they were not very comfortable about how to wear them how to put the Torilonco and so on so it was very interesting to mm -hmm. see that uh, they were first considered, or they considered themselves as lacking authenticity because they were not the right region in the ninth uh, region. Uh, they were also thinking they were lacking authenticity because they were not speaking Mapudungun. Mm -hmm. 
it's called very few of them are speaking like one one and uh, also uh, like trying to know how to wear to properly wear mapuche clothing but on the other side they were very uh, they wanted really to be recognized as Ma uh, as mapuche in regard with their um, the history of discrimination and dispossession they had so they were con they knew they were mapuche because of this history family mm -hmm. and collective history but they have to perform also, or they wanted to, to, to perform the good way to be uh, Mapuche, to be recognized also as such by other ones. So th this, this is maybe one example of, of this performance. Um, and the other question you have about the mapping of the land and how it allows an, an outlaw mobility practices. Um, maybe it's important to understand this, uh, to know that there are a lot of issues about inheritance of land there. It means that these lots uh, have been uh, granted to people that might have passed away and uh, now there are like six or eight children or even grandchildren and this is still not tr truly resolved who owns the land. And uh, because they are very small, small, like one hectare, so it's, it mm -hmm. does not allow for many people to live from from survival, uh, from agriculture. So many uh, families have go away uh, to Santiago, for instance, and they go, they come to, for the summer or spend a little bit of time during the holidays, and they consider themselves uh, entitled to have part of uh, potatoes or whatever. It's grown there, and uh, for the people who have remained there, it's very difficult sometimes to accept it. We have all the, the workload, no. and they come and take this. And for the other ones, it's difficult because we, we could not, we were not able to remain. We had to go, so it's a kind of uh, retribution for us having to, no. to to go. So this is maybe an example of how this mm -hmm. ordering and this impossibility to to increase the land also. Uh, has effect on people. Mm -hmm. uh, question for Your opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I think we're in the, in the time, right? Okay. So, mm -hmm. thank so you.